Hello, fellow foodies, and welcome back. This is Dr. Cassandra Quaid, and you're listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. On today's show, we're going to take a deeper look at one of my favorite nutritious vegetables. It's a plant that's found originally in the Andes, and it is known as a superfood. If you have quinoa in your mind, you are absolutely right. We're going to be talking about quinoa today. And our guest is actually an expert on quinoa. She's written a book with the title of Quinoa, Food Politics and Agrarian Life in the Andean Highlands. Her name is Dr. Linda Seligman. She's a professor of anthropology at George Mason University, and she's an expert on Latin America. She's done research in the Andean region for over 40 years. Linda specializes in agrarian issues, including the recent boom in quinoa consumption, quichua culture, gender relationships, and the dynamics of the informal economy of the Andes. She's been funded by the Winter Grin Foundation, um, and Seligman recently completed a project on quinoa, um, a substance that's been one of really great significance to the livelihoods and well-being of quichua inhabitants of the Andes for centuries. Her book examines how the place, value, and meanings of quinoa have undergone transformations in light of its demand as an internationally um, recognized superfood. So welcome to the show, Linda. It's really great to see you. Thank you, Cassandra. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Well, why don't we just start with a really simple introductory question. Can you tell me why quinoa? Why did you decide to write a book on this on this particular food? Uh, well, I, I had worked in uh, the district of Wanokite in uh, the southern highlands of Peru uh, for many years, and I hadn't been there for five years. And when I went back, I found that things were very different and that all of a sudden the farmers there with whom I'd done research before were extremely interested in quinoa and they were experimenting with growing it. Um, I also knew that, you know, people were consuming quinoa in the United States. And when I went to the uh, Inca capital, which is a tourist Mecca, Cusco, uh, there were all sorts of kinds of quinoa for sale, quinoa pop, quinoa cookies, all sorts of things. And so this really piqued my interest. Uh, why the sudden interest in cultivating quinoa? It had been a minor crop in the Andes, a, a valued one, but a minor crop. And so something was definitely changing. That's why I decided to pursue that curiosity and find out why more and more farmers were interested in trying to cultivate it. That's really interesting. So maybe to help our listeners have a better picture of what life is like in the Andes, can you kind of paint a visual of what is Wanokite like? What other crops are they growing? I'm assuming possibly potatoes. I know that potatoes originate in the Andes. Um, what other ty types of food are they growing and what's the, what's the environment like? Well, uh, Wanokite uh, is located at about a 11,000 feet above sea level. Uh, you can translate that into meters if you prefer. But what is, and it's, it used to be about eight to nine hours by truck from Cusco, a very arduous journey. And that really was the nearest market. Within Wanokite itself, it had an extraordinary number of different ecological zones and uh, you could grow all sorts of crops, uh, ranging from wheat, in, which was introduced originally by the Spanish, to different kinds of corn, to many different kinds of potatoes, as you mentioned, Cassandra, barley, broad beans, uh, lupines and legumes, um, and quinoa. And there was also, uh, you know, a not huge, but a herding complex, uh, not so much anymore, but of llamas and alpacas, because Wanokite for many, many years was a place where salt was mined. So it was a depot that was, you know, a trade depot as well, where people came 
to get salt and traded for other agricultural products. And it became known as a major breadbasket for Cusco. So it has some unusual characteristics. Um, it's definitely mountainous and it has intermontane valleys. And unlike some places, it had remarkably plentiful water because of a very sophisticated, extensive irrigation system dating from Inca times, possibly pre-Inca, that traversed from one relatively infertile area, but with plentiful water, into Cusco. And the environmental knowledge just needed to do that was astonishing. That's incredible. It's like a marvel of, of human engineering to be able to yes. have traverse that distance. Um, so it sounds like they have a very diverse opportunities for a diverse diet in, in Wanakite. Um, and how difficult is it to farm in this environment? I'm imagining a very montane area. Is there terrace farming? Um, or are they farming on kind of plateaus? Like what is what is, what is what do the agricultural like fields look like in this environment? Well, you know, you have to look at these historically, of course. So if we look at the present, there was a very flat, high plateau, very unusual in this part of the Andes of hundreds of acres. Um, and after a major radical agrarian reform in 1969, uh, it became a cooperative. And that's a story in and of itself that I don't think I have time to go into today. Um, and it was used for uh, agriculture and for uh, pasture land for animals. Since then, it became, uh, they stopped doing agriculture there and it's mostly occupied by housing, residential housing. Uh, the rest of the region is quite mountainous. And it is definitely a challenge to farm there. Um, you know, there are different degrees of slope, different degrees of rain and frost and sunlight. And all of those are things that uh, farmers take into account in determining what to cultivate, where to cultivate. Um, and there are some places where you can use a yoke of oxen. Some places you could use a tractor, but people mainly still use foot plows. Wow, that's that's incredible. It reminds me a lot of the work that I've done in the Balkans and the mountains where similarly you have very steep um, fields that you really can only work with oxen or by hand. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay, so we have this picture now of this high montane um, area where you have a diversity of crops growing. Now, I know in your research, you've done a lot of work on these concepts of food security and food sovereignty. And these are topics I teach about in my class as well. But I'm wondering, can you elaborate um, on what is the difference or the definition of food security versus food sovereignty? Just to bring our audience into context before we dive into the specific examples of Wanakite. Mm -hmm. um, those are good and complex uh, concepts and questions. Uh, most people, when they think about food security, they think about having basic food substances, substances uh, that will permit for uh, good nutrition um, and that will allow people to reproduce themselves and their families. That's a very simple way of putting food security. Um, and food sovereignty is who actually has rights to particular foods or agricultural products and why. Now, that sounds very simple. So what? But for some people, food security may be their food security. We are no longer divided by great physical distances in terms of trade, importation, exportation. So sometimes a food stuff, like quinoa, 
just to give an example, but there are many others in the course of history, becomes popular in other parts of the world. And so people may think that's a very good thing, but it doesn't necessarily translate or convert into food security for those who are growing it. So basically so the, the land, attention. is it that the land is being converted to, um, or more of the land, the agricultural lands are being used to grow crops for sale rather than crops for local consumption? Is that a part of the problem? Well, there are uh, incentives oftentimes mm -hmm. on the part of uh, governments or even in conjunction with non-governmental organizations that may be well-intentioned, but fail to realize that when you put too much emphasis on one crop for export, you may be jeopardizing the livelihoods of the people who are growing it. And sometimes the simple response is, but they'll be getting cash for that. They'll, they'll be getting returns for selling these things to on the export market or for the export market. But that doesn't work simply. And oftentimes the returns the farmers receive not only are meager compared to what they ultimately com command in larger cities or from intermediaries or, you know, in the country where they're consumed with the markup that takes place, but also um, it the labor and time that goes into that to produce for an export market means they have less time to cultivate this wide variety of crops that actually does provide them with food security. So that's one part of the conundrum or issue. And the other one in terms of food sovereignty is always a question of ongoing debate, which is the Quechua people, who are the descendants of the Incas, have engaged in agrarian activities for millennia. And they have such a wealth of knowledge and they have about their environment and how best to do agriculture in challenging conditions, which they actually regard as an opportunity rather than a constraint. That is, can we figure out what we could grow here rather than, oh, we can't grow anything here. And so they've been tinkering, experimenting. And, you know, I'm sure the figures are wrong actually, but there are up to 3,000 if not more, different varieties of quinoa. And obviously they've honed this knowledge. Um, and if you get into land races, and there's a difference between varieties and land races, there are even more. It's just staggering how many, you know, different kinds of quinoa are grown in a small environment. So the properties of quinoa are extraordinary, and it is wonderful to share that with the rest of the world. But many people think that some kind of almost like a copyright should return some kind of royalty to the farmers who have so successfully created these many different kinds of quinoa. quinoa. So we're talking yeah. about who has the right to control these crops. These genetic resources, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's fascinating. We've seen time and again when there is a valuable crop that's, that's entered into international trade that all too often, in fact, it's the norm that the people that have developed those, those varieties through selective breeding over 
and, and treated those through their families and passed down this genetic material over time, that they're not um, adequately compensated for that. And right. I think it's also important to note, you know, we're talking about crop centers of origin here in the Andes. Right. So with the potato, this is, you know, why we have so many different varieties of potato in the Andes. But there are many bitter varieties of potatoes. This is because they have, you know, grown these uh, species or varieties um, with differing levels of glycoalkaloids, which are a toxic bitter component of potatoes, which they can then remove. Now, right. likewise, quinoa <laughs> contains molecules called saponins. This is where I insert a little bit of pharmacology. So bear <laughs> with me on this. <laughs> but these saponins can cause irritation to the guts. So when you wash your quinoa in the sink, it kind of bubbles up. Our commercial varieties have very low levels of saponins. But I'm guessing that as part of their suite of diverse varieties and land races, there are probably a number of quinoa that are still grown in the Andes that have higher levels of these defense compounds. And of course, the reason that you would want to grow more toxic, more bitter varieties of your plants is because that's like a natural pesticide. It protects the plant, helps it to survive in these, um, these harsh conditions. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like have you, for example, in your work on quinoa, tasted the difference? Or are there certain ways that people process their quinoa to reduce the toxicity after it's been harvested? Uh, that's an excellent uh, question. And saponin is one of the major challenges of growing quinoa for export at scale, actually, um, because the people, and it's often mostly the women who are acutely aware of all the different kinds of quinoa and what they like to use it for. And so it's connected with aesthetics. It's connected with um you know, what they want to cook with it. But um, there's, an, in my own research, I found that there was a predominant desire to primarily use a yellow quinoa that is much higher in uh, saponin content. And so in order to make it edible, it requires far more processing, rinsing, as you said, sometimes up to 20 times, rinsing and rinsing and rinsing to get rid of that bitter outer hull, the saponin. Um, whereas the kinds that they are preferring for export tend to be sweeter, tend to have less saponin. And so it creates this tension between how much should be grown for what purpose. On the other hand, as you point out, and this is a very interesting sort of thing that people are playing with now, is that because of the properties like saponin, quinoa isn't just about the consumption of this grain. It's not exactly a grain. It's actually in the grass family, but that's just you know splitting hairs here. Um, but it's not only about that, it's about all these other properties that can add value to the question of growing quinoa. Because as you said, it's an excellent pesticide. It has medicinal qualities. Um, it, it can be used as a poultice for all sorts of things. Um, and then of course you can make all sorts of other things from it. Um, NASA took it on its space missions long time ago because it has so many amino acids and proteins and it's non, you know, it's gluten-free. Um, people say it can cure cancer in some instances. I don't know how much proof there is to that. But the point is there are things that are uh, qualities, attributes of quinoa. But once you start exporting a crop and you're intent on reducing the processing expense, unless you figure out a way to use that saponin, and you only concentrate on these other kinds, it's like monocropping. You narrow the diversity. And ultimately, not only is that not good for the people growing it, it's probably not good for the world. <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, and you know, it's interesting when we think about nutritious grains, I'm gonna throw a little bit of botany in here too, because um, 
you know, when we think about wheat, that's in the triticaceae family, people that have celiacs or gluten have to avoid that. Um, if you ever see on bags that you have labels of, you know, gluten-free rice, well, rice by its definition doesn't make gluten. So it's right. always gluten-free. Right. Um, and that's in the grass family, the poaceae family. And then we have the amaranths like quinoa, it's quinopodium, right. um, quinoa, um, that again is naturally gluten-free because that right. plant group doesn't make that molecule. So just, just a little bit of buyer beware for all of the, the folks out there that are trying to, you know, learn and, and read labels um, yes, these are always going to be gluten-free unless it's somehow processed in a similar, um, effect. like mixed with some flour or, or, that, or it's mixed with wheats and things like that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think this is interesting. You know, the fact that they're growing these different varieties, some of which have, it sounds like more medicinal properties, some of which are desired. Um, I think this also plays into food security. Right, because it, the more toxic varieties, the ones that take more work on the out, output end, may actually have a better shot at surviving. Um, you know, against threats from different pests and things. This is a major issue we've talked about in the show before. Where in industrial agriculture, we've moved more to what's known as monocropping, single species, and often single like genetic lineages. This is why bananas are at risk right now. They're all clonally propagated. Um, where you know they're very vulnerable to disease. But when you have a diversity of, of different varieties, have different levels of certain defense molecules, that may prop up, you know, or enhance your ability to access food in, in the future. I think I think they just do this, they illustrate this so well in Indian agriculture. It's really impressive. No, I, I think that's that's the whole point, is it there's so much unpredictability. And of course, now with the uh growing intensity and extent of uh, events connected to climate change. Mm, yeah. The rest of the world has become interested in indigenous knowledge, native knowledge and practices. And so people who had experienced racism, who may have been celebrated for touristic purposes, but without much attention to their li livelihood conditions, all of a sudden things are changing a little because there's a recognition that people like those in Wanokite have such an extraordinary fount of knowledge. And so by growing all of these different kinds of quinoa, Let's say they have a very harsh year with little rain. You know, they have kinds of quinoa that have been able to withstand that. Um, likely th the same thing, you know, if you have frosts that come early. So all of those things, you know, create food security, as you said, and they're increasingly important. Uh, to the whole world and to people in Wanukite if they want to persevere doing their agriculture. Yeah, no, that's so well said. But I'm wondering if you can share with us a little bit, Linda, about the ways that the people of Wanukite use quinoa. You mentioned a few of these, but I'd love if you have any recipes you can share or any just kind of what are some of the traditional means by which it's prepared how valued is this as a food ingredient? Is it often paired with other crops? Like, what is, how does how does quinoa fit um, in the dietary practices of the place where it originates? Well, if that uh, quinoa, as I said at the beginning, is a a minor crop, a value crop, um, but and and it is considered. It's not considered a staple in the same way that potatoes or rice or even now noodles are. So it's a complement to those things. And um, it's, it's consumed not infrequently, but in small amounts. And of course, uh, it's consumed in more ways now. Um, there are many quinoa recipe books and women have been experimenting with some of these new recipes. The way it's 
often consumed is as a soup and sometimes with potatoes and on ritual occasions there's a very special dish called pesque that is consumed that's quinoa that's boiled and mixed with milk and cheese and egg and it's absolutely delicious um sometimes it's roasted in a frying pan sometimes it's mixed into kind of a drink um or with a little liquor um and served on you know it's street street carts in the urban areas it's served hot sometimes it's made into a pudding but the way it's consumed is so and sometimes it's made into bread dolls for ritual occasions like the day of the dead and before uh, many many quechua households make their own beer especially for ritual occasions and labor parties and uh the primary ingre primary ingredient of that beer was maize but there are certain places where there's not very much maize and then people turn to barley or something else to make this beer but in Wanokite, they always made maize beer. But now with the quinoa craze, they're making quinoa beer as well and mixing it with some maize. So what does that taste like? Have you tried it? It's okay. I don't like it as much as maize beer. But, you know, it's part of what they're doing. And again, it shows you how open they are to trying out different things that might be good or might not or might have a niche in an array of things. But what's really interesting, and this is, you know, in the second half of my book, I really delve into this, is that everybody, a lot of people like quinoa, but people in the Andes like it in a very different way than most people in the US or Europe or Japan, uh, mostly Japan do, maybe South Korea as well, or Korea as well. But, um, in those countries, they're thinking more about, is this healthy? Will this, you know, will this go with other healthy foods? <laughs> you know, is it quick to prepare? Um, the the parameters, the criteria are very different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I use those parameters myself all the time. Yeah, sure, we all do. I mean, you know, I feel like I straddle worlds because I've seen both sides of it. Whereas in the Indies, when I talk to the women there, and I mean, the men, it, it, it's more mixed because they're very focused on the market, right? right now, although women are involved in the market too. But the women, it's about the taste. They're always thinking about the taste. And yes, they do think about what's good for them, you know, and what's good for their families. So that's also there, but it, it's much more individualized in the United States. And one of the things that struck me, and I write about this in the book, was one day when I was traveling somewhere and I was in three different airport lounges where <laughs> they had quinoa. And the way it was served was always mixed with other healthy foods, whether it was a salad or it was sushi or it was, you know, and so that was kind of the idea, you know, it's, it, it's what will make us strong and healthy in a very individualized way. And then you still have like government agencies and what they're trying to do, this isn't so much about what kind of quinoa they like, but it's more, and I don't mean this to be exactly a pivot, but it's more about um, how do we get people interested in our country and what it represents? You know, and so they draw on quinoa and the gorgeous rainbow colors of quinoa to promote, you know, this vision of their country and its native beauty. That's that's great. And quinoa is an incredibly beautiful plant. It is. Many colors. It's gorgeous. Well, um, I really enjoyed your book again. And just to show folks, it's a uh, Let's see if I've got it here. Quinoa. Oh, wonderful. Um, and, yeah. you know, near, near the end of your book, you make a pivot to talk a bit about this relationship between two topics I wasn't expecting, between quinoa and mining. 
what can you tell us about about that? You know, it's I wasn't expecting that to be part of my story either. And yet, when I first arrived after that hiatus away, about the five years away and coming back, and we went right away to my compadre, uh, which is a fictive kinship term, a co-parent. Um, he is a very esteemed farmer, now quite old, but we went right away to his field. Let's see if it's ready to be harvested. And so the next morning, seven in the morning, we were all there. And uh, when the men who were helping him were resting, they began talking. That That's when you talk about things. And uh, they were talking about things. And a lot of their talk was about mines. And a lot of quiet debate about were these mines good for people there? Were they going to cause problems? They could provide work to people, you know, but they could pollute things and there were injuries with the machine. So there was a lot of talk going on about mining within quite close proximity to Wanokite. And um, this has been an ongoing issue in Peru. And uh, the government granted many, has granted many, many hundreds, maybe thousands of concessions to transnational corporations and private companies all over Peru. That doesn't mean that they're actively uh, exploited yet, but they're there. And most of the indigenous people don't know that, not until something starts happening. And there have been very violent protests, there have been clashes, there have been blockades. So in the case, and there have been people killed uh, in these standoffs. Um, but it turned out that in addition to mines that already existed that people were worried about and that were already operating uh, and they were concerned because of the pollution they were causing, the damage they were doing to infrastructure and, um, you know, uh, those kinds of things, they found out that concessions that were located uh not very far from Wanokite, but close to five sacred lakes from which not only Wanokite, but other provinces and many other communities get their water from. And so there are many stories about these lakes. They're quite extraordinary. They are ethereal. Uh, they are located, you know, 4,200 to 4,400 meters above sea level. They're very, very high. And the stories are about how these lakes become perturbed and monsters appear and that it's very important not to disturb them. And it's really a story about protecting their environment and their invaluable water sources. Um, so what happened was that the mining started. And although there's still debate and dissent, ambivalence about what to do about it, eventually there was a concerted effort to protest further mining near these water sources because they could endanger certainly not only quinoa cultivation, but the entire agrarian foundation of so many regions, um, not only because of what they would do in terms of probably diverting water, but also polluting it. So that was the connection to mining. Um, 
and many, many stories that were circulating. And people actually went up there and they did manage to put a stop to temporarily. One never knows. But they did manage to temporarily halt the mining there. And they have been pursuing um, an effort to declare some of the plants that grow there as part of Peru's cultural patrimony in order to protect the lakes. Yeah, that's, it's such a challenge. I mean, I think across, across, um, I know beyond Peru and other countries in South America, we're seeing, um, you know, really horrific things come out of these, these interactions between mining and of course, loggers and indigenous peoples and their sovereignty to their, you know, and, and access to their land and clean water. Um, mm -hmm. It's really unfortunate, but I'm glad that you touched on this in your book because it does play into this global dynamic of such a crop, right? Um, what we purchase, what we consume has an effect in other parts of the world. And this brings me to my last question. And that's really around the, the agricultural or the intensification of agriculture around what was normally not an intensively grown crop, as you as you mentioned, but more of a minority crop. Um, have there been changes in practices with regards to herbicides or pesticides, especially if they are moving toward growing these less bitter varieties, because that's what's preferred in, in Western commerce? Um, have you seen or observed any, any changes there in those practices? Well, it's, it's uh, again, uh, quite complicated. I guess I have two points to make, uh, given the time that we have. Uh, one is that there actually has, was, it's, it's changing a little, but a drive on the part of the regional government to have the members of the Quinoa Cultivators Association, um, yes, grow certain kinds of quinoa rather than others, but also to move toward organic quinoa cultivation. And in fact, I mean, uh, many people would be in favor of using less pesticides and less fertilizer, but it's much more difficult and it takes a long time. And in the first effort to do this after the great boom, uh, the association decided to cull together, gather together all of their quinoa rather than selling it by household to, uh, pool it all together. That's what I meant, to pool it all together and to sell it to an intermediary in Arequipa, uh, which is a coastal city near the coast. And uh, they were very excited about this. They were getting a good price. They were thrilled. And it was rejected. And you know, they, they lost their shirts. Um, and I have to say here, which we didn't talk about much, is that it's only really the better off farmers who can afford to take these kinds of risks. So you're leaving out quite a few farmers. So that's creating inequalities within the village areas as well. But in any case, uh, it turned out that the claim was that the the quinoa wasn't organic, that they found pesticides. And the farmers adamantly denied that. And they thought it had been mixed with other batches from somewhere else that caused the contamination, or perhaps there were traces from prior seasons because they rotate crops when potatoes were grown. So some people are still fiddling around with organic quinoa, but there's kind of been a reassessment of whether it's a good idea or not. 
Um, for health reasons, I think a lot of people think it would be a good idea there. And uh, there are some scholars, and you you may know about this, Cassandra, um, who have suggested that it's much better, again, just like monocropping and the issues around it, don't do all or nothing. Maybe some of your quinoa is organic and some of it isn't. You know, and maybe that's a better way to approach it. Um, so, so those are other issues that are coming into play here because of the West demand, especially for organic foodstuffs, and for some good reasons. Yeah, yeah. But it's harder to get there. Um, the other thing, and this is more generalized, quinoa is a hard crop to grow. It's very difficult to grow in terms of what's required. And my book discusses blow by blow what's entailed in producing quinoa. And then, of course, the processing, which we already discussed. So some of these plans, for example, to increase food security by adding quinoa to the school diets, you know, or more native foodstuffs to school diets. Great idea. Whose, bur whose burden is it? Do people get paid for this? No, they provide their own foodstuffs from the different households. And this leads me, so, so, or, you know, where you're growing at scale for an export market, which sounds good in the abstract, um, it's another major point that I make in the book, which is it leads to what I call not only a kind of extractive economy, but it also it extracts people's identities and their souls and their emotions. You know, it's, it's not just economic. And I think we often don't see that. Indigenous people the world over, and, and certainly the Andean people are no exception, adapt. They adapt. They can. They move between urban and rural areas in order to knit together livings. They engage in, you know, three or four kinds of activities. They'll try to grow in new ways, but it takes a toll. It exhausts. And it's not just economic exhaustion. And I think we often don't see that. It carves out part of people's ability to have the energy to keep on doing these things. And since they're so intent on doing these things, and I would be too in that situation, that's not something they're really thinking about. They're just doing it until it just becomes too much. And sometimes, you know, and I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if if some of this converts into, you know, kinds of political activism and resistance that we saw very recently in Peru. That's that's such a great point. I, this idea of, of extraction, exhaustion of extractive economies, exhaustion of resources, of, of the resources of of people right and, and, their, and their their identities and their identities their cultural identities their connectivity to their to their traditional diets if they can no longer grow all the diversity of foods that would be typical to their traditional diet and then there is of course exhaustion of the soil um yes. over time so it's it's a very complex it's a very complex topic and when one thinks about quinoa Again, I think it goes back to those two points you mentioned earlier of like, oh, what can I pair with to make this, you know, my superfood with my, you know, my super grain that I have here? I and mean, how fast and easy can I throw this into my rice cooker and let it go? Um, I think these are the questions that we as consumers focus on. And maybe, you know, I think what what you've done here and in your book is really unveil a deeper sense of understanding the human consequences of um, on agrarian, you know, life ways and on food ways um, in the places where we get these crops. So very fascinating, moving topic. Thank you for, for coming on the show, Linda. It's been great. Oh, you're welcome. I really, I enjoy being able to explain some of this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
All right, fellow foodies, you can find this and all of our other episodes on our website at foodiepharmacology.com. You can also head over to the Teach Ethnobotany YouTube channel where we have the video version um, of this episode and others. I want to give a big shout out of thanks to our show's producers, to Rob Cohen and Christine Roth of Co-Conspiracy Entertainment. Um, also, if you're interested in supporting the show, there are a number of ways that you can do so. You can head over to mysterycontrol.com. Again, that's mysterycontrol.com. And you can find lots of fun foodie t-shirts, mugs, um, totes, lots of, of, of great swag, really beautiful artistic designs there um, that you can enjoy and share with your friends. Um, thank you so much for listening. I want you all to stay healthy out there and I'll see you next time. <laughs>